History does not repeat. It instructs. Oh, shit. In 1483, oh. the Portuguese explorer Diogo Chao landed at the mouth of the Congo River and claimed the lands around it for Portugal. He then sailed up the River Congo and realized there was a problem with his claim. These lands were already inhabited by a people living within a structured and well functioning state. A kingdom with it a don't capital called Mbanza that already had a population of 60,000 and was therefore just as large as Lisbon. This was the first contact between Europeans and the king. I watched this one. <sighs> Bro, that hurts my feelings, man. That's rough. Kingdom I wanted to watch Congo, this together, man. The Congo Kingdom. Diogo sent four of his crew to be. Oh, you're right. Oh, shit. You see, streaming is actually harder than you would normally think. Thank you, my man. Thanks for uh, telling me because I, I actually didn't realize. Okay, there we go. That shit. What? What the hell? Oh, you gotta be kidding. Okay, there we go. Boom. Nice. There we go. Thank you, my man, Oirid for uh telling me that the i didn't realize it to the king of the congo and took four congolese with him back to portugal to serve as the congo king's ambassadors to the king of portugal a year later and 590 miles to the north of the congo estuary another portuguese alvaro camina built a portuguese settlement on the island of sao tome just off the coast of the gold coast sao tome, in principe, sao tome had that's no like a native country right? the first use of the island was as a sort of prison colony for people expelled from portugal for being deemed as undesirable, like Portuguese Jews. Being a volcanic island, the soils were fertile and conducive for the growth and harvesting of cash crops, primarily sugar. And it is here where the history of the Congo and the history of Portugal cross paths to change the world with two innovations. The Portuguese invented the plantation on Sao Tome, vast networks of cash crops run by a central processing structure to maximize output through the use of monocultures and the abuse of forced labor. But there was a problem. The first forced laborers were expelled Jewish children who died. And at one point, Portugal ran out of Jews and others it considered- Be patient, watch till the end. Yeah, I'm like, okay, this is about the Congo, which is interesting, but this video is about Saudi Arabia. But I think it's probably gonna get a, a point across. Undesirable yeah. to be forced onto Sao Tome plantations. So they started sailing the coast of West Africa, kidnapping Africans from coastal villages and forcing those to work. And it was there where the Kingdom of Congo contributed its own innovation. It went on war raids deep into Africa, kidnapped men, women and children and sold them to the Portuguese. This is where the transatlantic slave, slave trade, trade was born yeah. before it actually became transatlantic. The model of running sugar plantations... I mean, for us, uh, the people that are living in the Americas, this was this changed our history. This made m most of our countries possible. Because, you know, in most uh, in colonial societies in the Americas, slaves really built a lot of the infrastructure. So, uh, pretty interesting bit of the origins of the Portuguese slave trade with African slaves Again, was such an know, incredibly what has to do with Saudi Arabia, but all right, the I'll take it. copied it in their South I'll American it, colonies, man. where the Spaniards copied them, and eventually everyone copied the Spaniards. The Portuguese may have had to share the slave plantation economy and concept with others, but there's one <laughs> the thing Dutch they retained Danish. control of, the slave trade. Well, not entirely on their own. The Congolese king converted to Catholic Christianity, but his relationship with the Portuguese oh, what a was fucking a little loser, strenuous. Dude. He refused to abandon polygamy as the Portuguese missionaries <laughs> demanded, and also refused to change the political structure of the Congo, which was a kingdom in which an aristocracy talking about polygamy, right? Aristocrats into a hey, yeah, talking about polygamy. Uh, did you know that most Saudi kings have like twenty plus kids because they have multiple wives? I actually didn't knew. Uh, now we know. Explain the situation of Saudi Arabia through another example. How do you feel about Saudi Arabia collapsing since you're going to work in a Gulf country? Well, I just hope it doesn't affect uh, the United Arab Emirates, although probably will. I don't know. <laughs> there are parallels with Saudi Arabia explore at the end. Okay, gotcha. Hereditary monarchy. I mean, now I could see them because a lot of the Gulf countries do have slave labor or slave-like labor, you know. So... 
When the king died, one of his sons seized the throne through the help of his mother and the civil war. He converted the kingdom to Catholicism, however he continued to clash with the Portuguese over the slave trade, which he believed should be entirely controlled by the Congo kingdom and was angered by Portuguese slave raids in his kingdom. He wanted a slave trade monopoly. Two kings later, by the 1550s, the Congo Kingdom became an absolute hereditary monarchy and formulated a military alliance and economic alliance with the Portuguese. The well, Congo kings go. would conduct raids in Africa to capture Africans, transport them to the coast, and sell them to the Portuguese slave trade. I think I could see more and more of the similarities on Saudi the Arabia Kingdom in its slave raids, but not go on raids to kidnap Africans themselves. This was the beginning of one of the most lucrative trade agreements in human history. For almost two more centuries, the Portuguese and Congo kings would continue to hold almost a complete monopoly on the transatlantic slave trade. The Spaniards, the Dutch, the French and the British may all run slave plantations, but it was the Portuguese who shipped the slaves and from who you had to buy. And the Portuguese in turn bought most of their slaves from, from the, the Congo, Congo Kingdom. Kings. The plantation economy of the New World okay. became the foundation oh, upon gotcha. which the first globalized economy was built, and the fuel burnt to keep it running were African human beings. The wealth the Congo kings amassed through their steel was legendary. They lived in palaces surrounded by ivory, the silver of South America, the gold of Mexico, the silks of China, the craftworks of Arabia, and spices of India. The ambassadors were guests of honor throughout the many kingdoms of huh. Europe, and Why'd you, you can look at still that? see their portraits in national galleries in Portugal to this day. But you can only see their portraits but. in Portugal and some in Brazil. So where are the Congo kings now? The Congo kings were part of the first modern economy. But yeah, it's, it'd be interesting to know, you know, there are a lot of videos that talk about where are the royal families of certain countries, you know, I think of the Habsburgs or the Hohenzollers, but uh, I mean, yeah, maybe, maybe there's still uh, some sort of dynasty from the Congo kingdom, right? Who knows? Because of the part they played, they never modernized themselves. Mm. The Portuguese introduced the Congo kings to technologies such as navigation, the wheel, the plow. Bro, it's got your gold. I know, Congo right? Kings never adopted Fucking these technologies. Assholes. There was simply no reason to do so. The entire economy was built around kidnapping and selling Africans into slavery. There was no need to plow fields and conduct investments in agriculture. No need to build ships. Okay, okay. I, I, I see it more and more and more, you know? Yeah, I, I think I see a lot of the similarities between Saudi Arabia and the Congo Kingdom. No reason to build cars okay, that yeah. exported goods on land and no reason to print books. There was, however, an imported European technology which the Congo kings did adopt. Did you, did you guys saw that uh, city that Saudi Arabia is planning on building? It's like a vertical uh, or a horizontal line of a city, right? Uh, supposed to be very modern, but it's a very strange very concept. Quickly. I don't know. And used to its fullest effect. Oh, the guns. The gun. Equipped with these guns and learning to make them and use them, the slave raids became even more efficient at kidnapping Africans yeah. to sell into of slavery, course. but also to violently subdue competition and assert control over the slave economy, thereby increasingly destabilizing the region. The line, the for some reason, I could add words for here in Germany. Of slavery <laughs> in its entirety. I know, the it, there's a lot of ads for that thing. manipulated markets to increase their output holding back on selling slaves during the Caribbean harvest season to artificially hike up the prices and then sell more at greater profit. But through the economy being entirely built around slavery, slavery Clown also project, began to yeah. deeply impact society and that's what happens when you have a bunch of money, you know, political structures. The Congo Kingdom was an absolute monarchy with an aristocracy that acted as the governors of the regions. By the 1560s, the monarchy also became hereditary. A fellow German. The laws of the kingdom yeah, I have a couple Germans in the chat. That's the nice. King wanted them to be. Taxation was therefore completely arbitrary. New taxes were enforced whenever the king wanted to take something from someone or for other weird reasons. There was a tax that had to be paid for every time the king's hat fell from his head. This arbitrary nature of governance is Saudi Arabia like that further investment or innovation in economic sectors outside of slavery. Why invest in plows and build on agriculture when the king can just take away whatever you built on a whim? 
Those who displeasured the king found themselves the king dispossessed has cringed. and sold into slavery with their <laughs> entire families. Through slavery, an authoritarian state became even more authoritarian, and society became more reclusive. Ironically, as state power centralized within the figure of the king, society decentralized. Aristocrats and peoples moved away from the cities, moved as far away from roads as possible to be as far away as possible from the slave trade as to not fall victims themselves to it or to its arbitrary and violent nature or victims to the arbitrarily enacted absolute power of those who controlled it. West Africa... I mean, I don't want to... Okay, well, no, yeah, let's continue. I was going to spoil. And while the remaining participants in the global right. economy that slavery fueled managed to modernize and innovate through the development of other sectors, the Congo Kingdom, the very source of that fuel, stagnated and decayed. When slavery was abolished by the Congo Kingdom's yeah, customers, exactly. the Congo state collapsed. Various little aristocratic statelets emerged in a continuous violent struggle with each other. And again, you can clearly see the left. link between the, the Saudis of and... raiding your neighbors, kidnapping their people, and stealing their wealth continued, only this time within the kingdom itself. Banditry basically became its main source of income. Although the kingdom continued to exist in name up into the 20th century, it was huh. by the 1800s little more than a selection of constantly feuding warlords who, when French colonial officers arrived, had no means to put up a unified resistance against colonization. The last of the Congo kings was made a powerless vassal of the Portuguese, while the rest of his lands were carved up between the French and Belgians. When the Congolese rebelled in 1914, the, the Portuguese the RC, crushed right? the rebellion and made the lands part of the Angola colony. An Angola. Amplified by colonial rule, the disarray and decay which slavery wrought upon these lands still ravage it to this day. The Congo yeah. is a place unable to centralize. I mean, talk about like the early 20th century and the, the brutal history of the Congo. Uh, like King Leopold and all his horrible policies about the Congo that's fucked up and then you had like the Congo Civil War one of the deadliest uh wars in human like in recent human history I think it's one of the deadliest after or before no after World War II and now the Congo is like one of the poorest places in the world so you know you can trace all of that back to the stupid decisions of the Congo Kingdom and I guess now soon he's gonna make a connection between Saudi Arabia and the Congo then the Saudis took over uh uh, they kicked out the Hashemite royal, uh, who ruled the uh, Hejaz for like uh, 800 years. The Hashemite royal family are now kings of Jordan. Oh, nice. Uh, Channel Adam something. Probably will make a video about it. It'll be really funny. His new Egyptian capital and Dubai videos are really good. Adam something. Uh, yeah, let's do it. Fuck it. Why not? Let's finish this and... Able to unite, watch unable to remove foreign dominion and exploitation of its resources and peoples, and compounded by legacies of colonialism, continues Sire to be ravaged by Congo. civil wars, exploitation, anarchy, and poverty. Nothing remains of the legendary wealth of the Congo kings. And then... Then there's the Saudis. On the 14th of February 1945, the USS Quincy sailed into the Suez Canal. On board was the US President Roosevelt. Dying with only weeks left to live, he had still come personally to conduct a meeting that he believed was essential to the future of the United States and the <laughs> development of a global economy that could stand up to the Soviets after the Second World War. He Oil. met with King Abdulaziz ibn Saud on the ship, and the two men struck a deal. The Saudis would provide access to their oil fields to sell oil to the United States and its European and Asian allies. In exchange, the United States would provide military aid and secure the mm. defense of Saudi Arabia against all its enemies. The hydrocarbons of Saudi Arabia, the Emirates, Kuwait, Oman and Qatar would be the fuel burnt to build the global economy of the 20th century. The kings of Arabia yeah, would gain almost fantastical wealth through this trade. They lived in palaces surrounded by all the luxuries of the modern age. But none of them have innovated or created 
any economic sectors outside of hydrocarbons. That's... Their palaces are built by foreigners. Mm. Their luxuries are made by foreigners and imported by foreigners. Their enormous wealth is used to bribe the poorer neighbors into submission and thereby stagnate political development throughout the entire region. They control the hydrocarbon market ruthlessly, manipulating prices to ensure their own wealth, but also to crush outside competition. I just have to say, I just really have to comment that the art in this video is flawless. It's just so good. I mean, I don't think there's any creator, and maybe I could be wrong, but someone who creates such beautiful art like this, on like country ball art, it's just, I don't know. I don't know of any. Sorry, Saudi Arabia and the other Gulf states will uh, see increased profits due to Russia, but uh, the EU seems uh, like it's going to speed up green energy faster to avoid dependence on autocracies after this war true and if they increase their uh, production of green energies that means a lot short no long-term losses for the Gulf countries. There's nothing being manufactured or any technologies being adopted and further invested upon or innovated upon. The only innovation they were all quick and happy to embrace were the weapons the Americans provided which they used Sounds to pull all those who displeased huh. them into line, and they stabilized the region through the arming and financing of various death squads. Their political systems are absolute, authoritarian, archaic and stagnant, and the enormous wealth they gained only made those systems more absolute, they made it worse, authoritarian, yeah. archaic and stagnant. The laws they enforce are arbitrary. Civil liberties are an alien concept, and whatever wealth you build can be taken from you at any given moment if a king should wish it. Consequently, whatever substantial investments are made by citizens are almost entirely bunkered abroad. Those who displeasure the king are banished, disappear into dust. I mean, yeah, I get what he's saying, obviously, but could you say that all... Uh... Arabian countries are the same because you know Dubai seems like I mean of course Dubai and the United Arab Emirates are not the same thing one is a city the other is a country but it seems pretty well diversified I don't know I mean when you're talking about Saudi Arabia sure I get that dungeons were outright murdered civil society has consequently retreated into private homes under a social contract that guarantees that they will be left alone as long as they do so. A public civil society or public space does consequently not exist. Civil society is therefore fractured and decentralized with a deep distrust of everyone, while the state remains all-powerful and centralized as long as it continues to run on the money made through hydrocarbons. If they keep running on hydrocarbons, the future of Saudi Arabia and the Arab Gulf states is to be the next Congo. Damn. What the hell? Right, like, come on. I think it's very true. I think it's more true for some countries than others. You know, like I said, I think the United Arab Emirates is like probably the one that's doing the best effort to diversify its economy, right? There's, I mean, Dubai and the Dubai airport are huge, right? And the tourism industry there, it's pretty big. Of course, there's a lot of investment, a lot of banking, uh, but who knows? Probably, I mean, oil obviously plays still a huge role on it, but months. Okay, so, yeah, so there, this is the economy of the United Arab Emirates. We've got oil and natural gas. It's still the biggest industry at 17%. But 70%, that's a little lower than I expected, to be honest. Financials and insurance activities, that's 10%. Manufacturing, 10%. Construction, that's huge in the UAE, uh, 10%. And then you got like more things, transport, real estate, blah, 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 blah. I don't know. Exactly, 17%, it's a lot lower than I thought. Let's look, let's look Saudi Arabia, though. 